Welcome everyone, uh, welcome to our Tuesday Colloquium. It is my pleasure to introduce the speaker of today is uh, Kyle Nesbitt. Kyle is a um, PhD candidate from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. His advisor is uh, Jim Smith. And Kyle and I actually, we were at IBM at the same time. We shared a summer in Yorktown building a couple of years ago. So um, anyway, so let Kyle proceed. He's gonna be talking about virtual private machines. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I, it, this is amplified. Can, can everybody hear me all right? Yeah. Great. Um, so, yeah, so, so thank you for the introduction. Thank you for having me here. Uh, the title of this talk is Virtual Private Machines, a Resource Abstraction for Multi-Core Computer Systems. As Professor Seze mentioned, this is work that I did with my advisor, Professor Jim Smith, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So the motivation for this work is really two conflicting trends. On the application side, what we see is that um, general purpose computing is moving off of desktops and onto devices such as smartphones and data center servers. Now the thing that's unique about this, at least in comparison with desktops, is that these devices will host a very diverse set of applications uh, where an important part of those applications will have uh, strict performance requirements. Now to illustrate this point, I have this Apple iPhone here. And so traditionally this is considered to be an embedded device, where the core functionality of this device is a set of real-time applications. But at the same time, this device is becoming more general purpose. Already we have web browsers and other productivity applications. And going forward, this device is also becoming an open device. Apple's released their software developer kit, and now anybody can develop their own specific uh, general purpose applications for this device. Now on the architecture side, what we see is a conflicting trend. And that is high performance semiconductor manufacturers are moving aggressively towards more efficient designs. In particular, multi-core designs. Now multi-core are more efficient for a number of reasons. Uh, the main reason I'm going to focus on here is that multi-core allow concurrently executing threads to share costly microarchitectural resources. Now this increased resource sharing improves the overall utilization and efficiency of the, of the device. However, the way it's implemented in today's systems is it leads to unpredictable performance, conflicting with our application trends. So the goal for this work is to provide an abstraction where we can get the best of both worlds, both high efficiency and predictable performance. Now to give you a better idea of what I'm talking about when I talk about these microarchitectural resources, I'm going to start with an example of a conventional system. So this is what a conventional system looks like today. It has four processors where each processor is on its own die. And attached to each processor is effectively a private memory system that consists of an L1 cache, L2 cache, and a private port to SDRAM. Now the good thing about this type of organization is that the OS has complete control over the resource sharing. That is, by assigning a task to a processor, the OS, in effect, assigns an entire slice of the system's resources. Uh, in addition to the processor, I'm sorry? Oh. <laughs> in addition to the processor, a, a private memory system. So the OS can use this, this, this mechanism, time slicing mechanism, in order to precisely satisfy task quality service requirements. Now the shortcoming of this approach is that these resources these costly resources are really partitioned at a, at a pretty coarse granularity. And in general, uh, tasks' resource demands do not match that granularity. Either a task's resource demands are, are very light, and there's a bunch of unused resources in that private memory system, or a task's resource demands are very heavy, and if the lack of resources constrains or limits the task's performance. Overall, this is a very inefficient way to use uh, costly resources. Now when we move into the multi-core era, what we were able to do is we are able to integrate multiple, chip, or multiple processors onto the same die. And this allows us to share these costly microarchitectural resources at a very fine granularity. So when I talk about shared microarchitectural resources, what I'm going to primarily focus on here today is the L2 cache bandwidth, the L2 cache uh, storage or capacity, and the SDRAM main memory bandwidth. I'm not going to consider this main memory capacity because it's not a microarchitectural resource. It's already exposed to the operating system 
through a set of paging mechanisms and managed by OS policies. In contrast, these microarchitectural resources tend to be managed in a much more ad hoc manner. They're managed by independent hardware policies. Um, and the naive approach would be, say, first come, first serve for the, bandwidth, for the bandwidth resources and least recently used for the storage resources. Now, as I said earlier, the, the good thing about this organization is it leads to higher resource utilization. The bad thing is that based on these policies that we have implemented in our memory hierarchy, um, a very aggressive threat is able to increase the contention on these shared memory system resources and really end up violating tasks uh, quality of service requirements. That the OS has really lost control over the system's resources. So to summarize, in contemporary multi-core systems, what we have is we have this microarchitectural resource sharing for higher efficiency, but that really is, uh, uh, comes at the cost of unpredictable single task performance. And the objective of this research, research is to have the best of all of these. The microarchitectural resource sharing, predictable performance, and also, because we're able to coordinate the management of both the microarchitectural resources and processor time slices, higher aggregate performance. And to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to expose these microarchitectural resources to the operating systems through a set of mechanisms. And, and I really believe that this is kind of representative of a fundamental paradigm shift. That as we go forward, the cost of this memory system and these, these, these microarchitectural memory system resources is increasing. And it's, has a, it's contributing to performance uh, much more. And at the same time, processors are, processors are becoming abundant. So we're really entering a new domain where we're managing and scheduling these memory system resources efficiently is more important than scheduling the processor resources. Now, I made a number of contributions uh, to this new paradigm. First of all, I, I, I proposed the first complete set of microarchitectural sharing mechanisms. This includes the first mechanisms to man manage SDRAM bandwidth sharing and the first mechanisms to manage cache bandwidth sharing. And by implementing a complete set of these mechanisms, we are able to realize what we call is the virtual private machine abstraction. The, the interface between policy and mechanism in future multi-core systems. Also in my thesis, I propose kind of a high-level extensible VPN policy architecture where uh, application policies and system policies can use this virtual private machine abstraction in order to satisfy a broad range of application uh, requirements or system requirements. Now the outline of this talk somewhat follows my research philosophy. I'm going to start talking about the, the VPM framework at a very high level, at somewhat of an ideal or theoretical level, and then talk about what it means actually in practice. So I'm first going to formally define what a virtual private machine is and uh, describe the properties that it provides, quality service and performance isolation. Then I'm going to describe how these things are actually, how this ab abstraction is realized in both hardware and software. I'm going to provide a short valuation and discuss some future research directions. Now, as I started this talk, I said that we're going to have a very diverse set of applications with very diverse requirements. Now, instead of focusing on a very narrow set of those application requirements, my thesis looks at a more general resource management framework. And the basis of this framework is a very old and well-established design principle, and that is the design of policy and mechanism, where we implement the policies, which pr effectively provide the solutions in software, and we implement them in software so that they can be configurable on a per-application basis. Now, the mechanisms provide the primitives for those solutions. And those primitives ideally are universal. That is, uh, for any reasonable system and reasonable objective, those primitives can be combined in order to satisfy that objective. Um, and because these are universal, we can implement them in both a combination of hardware and software. Now what I'm going to primarily focus on is this virtual private machine, which acts as the interface between policy and mechanism. And what a virtual private machine does is it virtualizes a multi-core system's performance. Now, to illustrate what I mean by that, I have, uh, once again, my, 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 my multi-core architecture with these shared microarchitectural resources. So a virtual pipe machine allows a policy to decompose that system's resources into what looks like a set of virtual private machines. So in this first case, we have a graphics engine executing within a virtual private machine that's been assigned 50% of the cache storage, 50% of uh, the cache bandwidth, and 50% of the SDRAM memory system bandwidth. Uh, now, an important property that this virtual private machine provides is performance isolation. And what that means is that any task running in, in, this, in one of these virtual private machines would perform as well as the same task would if it were running on real hardware that had, had an equivalent configuration. Now, the job of the policies are to translate applications' performance requirements into one of these virtual private machines. 
and also distribute any excess service. And where excess service is service that is either unassigned resources, in this case 20% of uh, the cache bandwidth, cache storage, and cache or SD-RAM bandwidth, and also distribute unused resources, which implies that the policies that I'm talking about here are work conserving. Now it's important we distribute these excess resources in order to keep our, our utilization high. Now the mechanisms, what they do is they guarantee at runtime that these virtual private machine assignments are satisfied. So in addition to uh, the microarchitectural component of a virtual private machine, which I just, dis just discussed, a virtual private machine also has a temporal component, which is necessary in order to bound uh, a task's execution time. So that temporal component is effectively de uh, defines the amount of time that the microarchitectural resources are dedicated to a virtual private machine. And it's based on this notion of ideal proportional sharing. So let me describe what, that, what I mean by that briefly. So in ideal proportional sharing, we assume that we have a resource that does work at a constant rate R. And what we can do is we can allocate or assign shares of that resource to individual threads. In this case, phi sub i is um, the fraction assigned to thread i. Now what ideal proportional sharing states is that over any time period from t to tau, that this thread i will be offered service greater than or equal to the rate of the resource times the share of the resource assigned to the thread times the duration of the time period. So what this translates into pra in practice, what this translates in, in practice is it defines the fraction of the processor's time slices that our task will receive this set of microarchitectural resources. Now the job of the mechanisms is to provide quality of service. And what that means is that a task will receive at runtime a virtual private machine that is greater than or equal to the virtual private machine it's been assigned. And so what I've done notationally here is I've replaced this constant rate, R, with um, the microarchitectural component of my virtual private machine, where I'm representing the microarchitectural component as the vector of resource shares, uh, the element-wise product of the vector of resource shares and the vector of resource capacities, which in this case would be um, L, L amount of bandwidth, C, and K. Now to illustrate what I mean by uh, offering a virtual private machine that is greater than or equal to one of a, one, another virtual private machine, I have to def define that ordering. And so all that ordering means is that virtual private machine one is greater than or equal to virtual private machine two if each one of its resource shares in virtual private machine one is greater than or equal to each resource share in virtual private machine two, and the temporal component of virtual private machine one is greater than or equal to the temporal component of virtual private machine two. And to illustrate that pictorially, we have this example here where we have 50% for, for each one of the resources here and 10% for each one of the resources here. So what it means is that if we were assigned this virtual private machine, the mechanisms would satisfy that assignment if it were to offer a virtual private machine that's greater than or equal to the other virtual private machine at runtime. Yes? Why would you get the same proportion of each of the three resource types? Absolutely not. I just use that to keep the, the expression simple. It's important to note that uh, this is a partial ordering, so there are incomparable elements. In this case, we have uh, less cache bandwidth, but more cache storage. And we say these two are incomparable. If we assigned either one of these to a task, the other one wouldn't satisfy our definition of quality of service. Now, an important property, uh, workload independent property, that this, this, this uh, ordering provides is performance monotonicity. And all that means is if we run one task on both of these virtual private machines, then we are assuming that the performance of that task on our greater, our greater virtual private machine, will be, the performance will be greater than or equal than on the lesser virtual private machine. And in the case of incomparable virtual private machines, if we ask this question about performance, the answer is, well, we really don't know. It really depends on, on the workload, how well the workload uses the cache capacity that it's been assigned. Now, with all of this, what I can do is I can uh, precisely define my, my framework. So the job of the policy is to translate tasks, objectives into virtual private machines. They do that by assigning a, a, a set of um, microarchitectural resources and a temporal component for those microarchitectural resources. The mechanisms provide quality of service by ensuring at runtime the virtual private machine offered to a task is greater than or equal to the one that's been assigned. And assuming that we have performance monotonicity, then we can say that the system provides performance isolation, which as I described earlier, is um, the system will provide this task performance greater, or, performance greater than or equal to the performance of a real machine running that same task. A 
Okay, so now I'm going to move on and talk about what this actually means in terms of software and hardware. And so what this means, first of all, is we need a scheduler and we need the actual architectural support. So the scheduling problem turns out to be a very hard scheduling problem, which we've, we've had many discussions about but actually haven't solved yet. Um, so let me describe exactly what it is. So what the scheduler must first of all guarantee is that um, it satisfies the temporal component of each virtual private machine. And it does that by context switching these virtual private machines here onto processors, multi-core processors. It also needs to guarantee that when it maps a set of tasks onto these multi-core uh, processors, that none of the microarchitectural components of the virtual private machines conflict with each other. Now to illustrate what I, what I mean by that pictorially, I have my set of virtual private machines down here, and the OS would then, or the scheduler would then context switch these on, making sure that this case never occurs that we haven't um, over-signed you know, all of the, um, the cache storage. And so we need to make sure at all times we, we reach a feasible schedule. So this is a, is a very hard problem that we were talking to some real-time people about. And right now, uh, what it looks like is it's a multi-dimensional pa packing problem, which it, of course is an MP hard problem, but there are known approximate methods that can, that can be used uh, and adapted to the scheduling problem. So what most of my thesis worked on is, or focused on is the virtual private machine architectural support. And so what the architecture must, has to do is it has to have a mechanism for each one of these shared resources that is able to ensure that the resources uh, a task received, a res this, this resource that a task received is greater than or equal to the percentage of that resource that's been assigned to the task. So effectively it has to partition those resources. And by ensuring that we have a complete set of these microarchitectural resource partitioning mechanisms, we're able to ensure that we're able to satisfy the spatial component, or I'm sorry, the microarchitectural component of our virtual private machine. So at runtime, what this does is when a, a, a scheduler context switches a task onto a processor, it needs to use the microarchitectural component of the virtual private machine in order to configure um, these, these, these mechanisms and that configuration is done through a set of privilege control registers. So in my thesis, the mechanisms, or the architectural mechanisms that I, I actually was the first to propose are the mechanisms to partition the, the cache bandwidth and the SDRAM memory system bandwidth. So I'm gonna give you a precise example about how those work in the next couple of slides. And so the basic technique that we use to partition these resources is fair queuing from networking. And at a very high level, the way a fair queuing, uh, the way, the way a fair queuing algorithm works is it models each task or thread in this case as if it were executing with a private resource, a private bandwidth resource. And then based on that private bandwidth model, it computes the, the start time and, for, and finish times of a, a thread on that private resource. And it uses that start time and finish time in order to prioritize requests. So to do this modeling of these virtual resources, what we need is a set of registers. One register is a global clock register, which is, is used by all of the tasks um, in the system. The other register is a set, or the other is a set of virtual state registers, where there's one set of virtual state registers per virtual resource or virtual thread, or thread. Now what these registers include is a fraction of the physical resource allocated to the thread, the virtual start time, which tracks the time the next request will start on this virtual resource, the virtual finish time, which tracks the time the next request will finish on that virtual resource. Now to illustrate how these registers are used in order to co compute these virtual start and virtual finish times, I have this simple example of a single thread accessing a single virtual resource. So we have our clock, which is global to all the threads, and we have our virtual resource registers. So I'm gonna step a few cycles, and when my first request arrives, the first thing I need to do is determine what the virtual start time for this request would be. And to do that, all I need to do is compare the clock register with the start time register. If the clock register is greater than or equal to the start time register, we use it to update the start time register. So what this means is that a, a request cannot start in the past in our virtual time. Now for the request at the head of the queue, we need to compute a virtual finish time. And the way we do that is we take the start time of the request and we add to it our virtual service time where our virtual service time is simply the physical service time of our request divided by the bandwidth of this virtual resource, which in this case we're assuming a unit bandwidth physical resource, so the virtual bandwidth would just be one fourth. And based on that simple calculation, we can determine the time that this request would have finished if we were executing 
on a virtual resource with a fraction of the physical resource's bandwidth. And we use it to update our finish time register. Now the last thing we need to do is that when we service request, we need to uh, update our start time to reflect the time that that virtual resource would be available for the next request. And we simply do that by, by, by assigning that start time, um, the finish time of that request, of the last request. Now one thing I want to note, uh, which will be important for the example in the next slide, is that requests can have required different amounts of services, service depending on the resource that it's accessing. So in this case, this request requires two units of service. Um, I'm sorry. And uh, that, that two units is used in order to compute the finish time of that, that packet, or of that request. Okay, so now to combine all of this, I'm going to give you an example of um, how we compute the virtual start and finish times and use them to arbitrate amongst requests accessing a single, um, a single shared microarchitectural bandwidth resource. So the resource that we're focusing on here is the data array in the shared L2 cache. And we're assuming that data array is ECC protected, and I'll tell you why in, in just a few seconds. So in this example, what we have here is we have uh, three, three threads that are very aggressive and are streaming memory in and out of the memory system. They've already, in this example, have a bunch of pending requests available and ready to be serviced. So the requests with nothing in the box are considered to be read requests. And because they're access accessing this data array, they only require one unit of service. The requests with use in the boxes are update requests. And this is where the ECC comes into play, because when this request accesses accesses this data array, what it needs to do, it needs to read the old data out of that, that line, merge the new data in, and then write it back. So it requires two units of service on this resource. Now the last thread that we have here is a memory dependent thread. And so this one, unlike these, uh, has, a, has a memory reference pattern that's very dependent on the latency of the resource. What it's going to do, in effect, is generate one request. That request will go out. Once it's serviced, it will come back, and then it'll do five cycles of computation and repeat this process. Now this is kind of representative of, of a linked list traversal uh, where, the, where, the, where the, the linked list is resonant in our data array. Okay, so let me start walking through this. The first thing that's going to happen is my memory dependent thread is going to generate its first request and we're going to compute its finish time based on the calculation in the last slide. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to compare these virtual finish times and select the request uh, with the earliest virtual finish time first. In this case, we have a tie, and we're just going to assume that that tie is broken arbitrarily. So we're going to handle our second streaming thread and update its start and finish time registers. Once again, the arbiter will select the request with the earliest virtual finish time first. In this case, it's our memory dependent thread. It will be serviced, and then go back and start its five cycles of computation. In the meantime, these arbiters will continue the service request earliest virtual finish time first. This one is an update, so it takes two units of service. Um, in vir earliest virtual finish time first. In the meantime, this, this continues to compute. And after five cycles, what will happen is this memory dependent thread will generate a new request. We'll update our start register, compute our finish time, and continue to service request earliest virtual finish time first. So now what we've seen that we've, we've stepped through eight clock cycles here is that even though each one of these requests has very different memory traffic uh, or memory re request behavior, that we're able, using the fair queuing algorithm, to provide them all with their share, their assigned share of the resource. Now, if we use something like round robin, which many consider to be naively fair, um, I compute these results offline, and we see that, that, in fact, round robin is not fair. It doesn't take into account this uh, memory-dependent re uh, referencing re uh, rate, and it does not take into account um, the different resource requirements of the different requests. So up to this point, I've really kind of discussed these virtual private machine mechanisms at a very high um, level of abstraction. But in reality, what we need to do is we need to implement one of these fair queuing mechanisms in front of each contended, each contended for bandwidth resource. So here I have a graphic of um, what a, an actual physical memory system or shared cache would look like. And what it consists of is two processors that are connected by a full crossbar. And inside of these, we have uh, effectively these arbiters that control access to the tag array and data arrays. And so these are the arbiters that we need to replace in hardware in order to do this bandwidth partitioning. Now for the SDRAM memory system, uh, it's quite a bit more difficult. We have to make a number of modifications to the fair queuing algorithm because in an SDRAM memory system, what we need to do is we need to schedule multiple interdependent resources. So the way we do that is we effectively use that fair queuing calculation that I described 
and model this, this memory system as if it were operating at a fraction of the frequency of the physical memory system. So to do that, what we have to do is we just time scale each one of our SDRAM timing constraints by one over our allocated fraction of, of that memory system's bandwidth. So to walk you through just uh, a single request and how this would work, here we have a read request that is, is targeted bank two. That read request consists of an, uh, first an activate command, a read command, and a precharge. So we first use that activate command in order to calculate uh, the service time, the virtual service time for our, our bank. And what we do is we take the start time, which is our start register, and we add to it our virtual service time, which is simply the activation latency for the SD-RAM memory system, scaled by our allocated fraction of the bandwidth. Uh, when we come up to the read, the read actually requires service, first of all, from the bank to get the data out of the column, column, X, or the column buffer. And then once that, that data is out of the column buffer, it also requires service from the data bus. And so we use the same computations where, where this is the CAS latency, the, the, the actual latency to access that column buffer. Uh, and in this case, it's the burst length of the SDRAM memory system, which effectively determines the number of cycles that that, that, that SDRAM or that data bus will be consumed by this request. And so in this manner, we can effectively model our memory system and use, uh, we can model our memory system as if it were operating at a fraction of the frequency and use these virtual start times and finish times uh, in order to prioritize requests to provide our bandwidth partitioning guarantees. So now I'm going to provide a very brief over our evaluation. Now there's a number of uh, challenges that we ran into in, mo in, in actually evaluating this research. The first one was modeling a memory system microarchitecture in detail. And so most academic simulators don't do this, and this work really had to be, be done at, micro, or I'm sorry, at IBM Research. The second problem that we ran into is that once we modeled everything very well, it was too slow to simulate the long-term workload characteristics that we were interested in. So our solutions here, which I'll discuss briefly, is first of all, we built the structural performance model, which is able to capture these timing characteristics more precisely with less effort. And second of all, we use sy synthetic system level workloads. So the structural performance model, what it does and why it's different from most traditional performance model is that it decouples the timing and functional behavior of a computer system. Where the structural programming technique is used to capture the timing and procedural programming is used within these components to capture kind of the function of the components. The feature here is that by using structural programming, it has a much smaller semantic gap with respect to the actual hardware that we're, able, we're designing. And therefore, it's much easier to model these, these complex timing interactions, interactions. And so using this approach, uh, in a short period of time, about six months, we were actually able to develop a, a detailed processor model of the IBM 970 and validate it with a latch level model at IBM to be within 5% of um, the engineering group's model. And at this point, this model has grown quite a bit. I've used it for my thesis. It's approximately 100,000 lines of system C's code. And I recently got the right, rights from, from, from IBM um, to release this as open source software. So for um, the workload, what we use is a synthetic workload, like I said, for, for two reasons. One, one is so that we can capture these long-term OS scheduling behaviors. And the second reason is so that we can explore a very a broad range of application behaviors. As I described earlier, the objective for this work is to provide primitives that are universal, that apply to, to any type of workload or application that we, that we are interested in. And by using a synthetic workload, we can explore a larger application space. So the thing that um, is important for the results that I'm going to present about this, this synthetic workload generation is that we have eight tasks, and that those tasks are divided into subtasks. And the characteristic, the, the two first order characteristics those tasks have, is they have heterogeneous execution times, and heterogeneous memory system usage. And the main thing that we're going to focus on here is that subtask turnaround time. That simply is the time from when the, the, the subtask is injected into the system to the time at when it, you know, it waits in the, in, in the scheduling queues, runs on the processors, and then finally completes and exits the system. Um, so the policies that we're going to focus on for actually assigning virtual private machines are quite simple. And all they do is they assign homogeneous virtual private machines, which means that we don't have this co-scheduling conflict issue, which means that we can simply schedule these virtual private machines using an existing proportional fair multiprocessor scheduling algorithm. Okay, so the baseline that we're going to compare everything against is a private microarchitecture like I described in um, my motivation. So we have a private memory sy system where each processor gets one-fourth of the total 
of memory resources that we have. Um, and we're using proportional fair scheduling, where each, each task is assigned one half of a processor's bandwidth. Right? We have four processors and eight tasks. So it's a fair division of the bandwidth. We're also going to compare this with the LRU FCFS, which is kind of our naive baseline of what uh, it's representative of what's done in today's systems. We use the same proportional schedule with the same uh, fraction of, of, of processor bandwidth assigned to each task. And then the virtual private machine policy that we're going to compare this with initially is very similar in nature to um, our private microarchitecture, except we're mapping our virtual private machines now on top of our shared our, our microarchitecture resource management mechanisms. And so we have four processors and eight tasks, which means we can assign one-fourth of each one of these shared microarchitectural resources to each virtual private machine, each task. And we can assign one half of the processor, all processor's bandwidth, or one half of, yeah, processor's bandwidth represents a temporal component of our virtual private machine. So what this graph shows, first of all, is on um, the, the y-axis, we have improvement in average turnaround time. On the x-axis, we, uh, x-axis, we have the different configurations that we're going to, to evaluate. Um, all of our results are normalized to the pri private microarchitectural case. So in that case, uh, its, pr it's, it's, improvement, or its average turnaround time is simply one. Now in the LRU case, where we're able to use these resources more efficiently, efficiently what we see is that we have an, an, uh, about 25% improvement in the average turnaround time. However, the shortcoming of this is this. Um, what we plot here is we plot the individual uh, turnaround times of each subtask normalized to what they were when we were running on the private microarchitecture. So this is the worst case turnaround time of all the subtasks that we looked at. And so what we see here is that we've really uh, dipped quite a bit below um, the performance of this subtask when it was running by itself or when it was running on the private microarchitecture. At the same time, we see that some subtasks ran quite fast three times faster than they would have if they were running simply on that private microarchitecture. And so what we see is that we have a, quite a range of uh, subtask turnaround time, where that range is really determined by the workload characteristics of the different subtasks. The very aggressive workload characteristics were able to um, increase the contention on the resources, uh, you know, decreasing the performance of the less aggressive subtasks while increasing the performance of the more, um, uh, while, while the, the more aggressive subtasks actually performance increased. Now when we look at the virtual private machine configuration, what we see first of all is we get about the same performance that we did with LLU FCFS. In addition, what we see is that we have a much smaller range of normalized turnaround times. We also see that we, prov we, we do provide our, or satisfy our performance isolation objective. Right? Every single subtest that we executed has, had a performance that was greater than or equal to the case with the private microarchitecture. So this implies that we, uh, our virtual private machine provides quality service, uh, performance monotonicity in general holds, and also that we're work conserving, right? Because each task receives service that was greater than or equal to um, the performance of the private microarchitecture. Now the second uh, set of results I'm going to show is when I vary the microarchitectural component of these virtual private machines. So my first data point will be the data point that I just showed, where all the resources are equally assigned to the virtual private machines. And then I'm going to start to decrease the fraction of those resources that are assigned, all the way down to, to where only a half of the total system resources are actually dedicated to a specific virtual private machine. And so what this is going to do is actually increase the amount of excess service available in the system. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to distribute that excess service in order to optimize aggregate performance. Unfortunately, I don't have time to, to go into the actual aggregate performance optimizations, but if you're interested, you can look at it uh, in this technical report that's on my website. And so the takeaway here is that as we decrease the fraction of resources that are dedicated to a specific task, we can increase the amount of the aggregate performance of the system. But at the same time, that comes at the cost of decreasing the predictability of the performance of any given subtask. And so really, this is a very high-level policy that would allow, us, uh, say, a system administrator to balance uh, both predictable performance and aggregate performance based on what's important to the workload. So to summarize, um, I discussed the virtual private machine abstraction, and I propose using this as the interface between policy and mechanisms and future multi-core systems. 
where the policies translate high-level objectives into virtual private machines, and, and the mechanisms guarantee at runtime that these virtual private machine assignments are satisfied. Now, the real feature of what I believe of this work is that uh, it provides a very solid foundation for future work. And the two areas that I'm interested in are in uh, pr using these abstractions to support concurrent programming models and using the abstractions to better characterize uh, task resource requirements and then using those resource requirements to do SLCs and higher levels of system integration. So this research agenda is based on um, what most research agendas in, in computer architecture is based on Moore's law. And so typically, uh, Moore's law has been applied to, to improve performance. And going off in the future, the way the industry is tackling this is by increasing the number of cores that are going to be implemented or integrated onto a single die. Now, it's easy to integrate the cores. What's difficult is to program the cores. And so I'm going to look at uh, using, that, um, using abstractions in order to make the current programming easier. The second thing I'm very interested in is, uh, is kind of uh, not using the transistors for performance, but using those transistors to reduce the cost and power consumption of systems. And this is going to be, I think, important, especially for mobile devices. So what I'm going to use to do this future work is, is, is somewhat um, based on my, my prior thesis work, at least at the foundation. And on top of that, what we've started to talk about is an extensible policy architecture. And what that extensible policy architecture does uh, is broken into system policies and applic application policies, where the application policies translate applications objectives into virtual pipe machines. And this can be done on a per-application basis. The second thing it does is that once one of these virtual private machines has been assigned to uh, an application, it then is able to schedule and manage that, that application's virtual private machine as if it were a real machine. The system policies, what they do is they, 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 they broker incoming applications virtual private machine requests. So let me illustrate how I can use one of these application policies at a very high level in order to optimize um, a concurrent application's performance. And this is meant to be a high-level example that just illustrates some of the features of this abstraction. So what I have here is I have a streaming application. And that streaming application consists of, of three actors that are consuming and producing data. And those, those, those actors are effectively decoupled by um, these memory buffers, which, are res which reside in um, main memory, or at least in the main memory address space. And at a very high level, um, our application developer has some type of performance objective for this streaming application. And so this performance objective really defines the rate at which you, you want to uh, consume and produce data through these, through these different phases of the application. So the first thing that this application policy will need to do is translate that high-level performance requirement into an actual VPM configuration. In this case, because we have, um, um, because we have a concurrent application, it will translate this into a multiprocessor VPM. So this is one extension of the virtual private machine abstraction, which actually is also a nice extension of gang scheduling. In addition to spe specifying the number of processors um, that this application needs to run, we're now specifying effectively the memory system that that application would need to run efficiently. So this translation from these high-level uh, uh, performance objectives can first of all be done either offline by an application developer. And I plan to look at some of the developer tools and analysis required to do that. Or it could be done online in a simple fashion using just uh, performance counters and other heuristics. I plan to look at both. Now, once this application has been assigned this virtual pipe machine, we can implement an application scheduler, which is able to schedule these processors and manage that, that virtual pipe machine's um, shared microarchitectural resource. One of the other interesting extensions to this abstraction is recursive virtualization, where the application scheduler is actually able to assign or, or break up the assigned virtual private resources and assign them to individual tasks. So this is a way to support um, specialized hierarch hierarchical resource management policies and also distribute uh, the scheduling burden across a larger percentage of the chip. The last thing the scheduler would have to do is effectively map our concurrent application um, in an application-specific way onto uh, the available resources. And so it mapped the, the individual actors onto separate processors and it used these rates in order to configure the bandwidth necessary throughout each one of these um, virtual private machine memory hierarchies. It uses the size of these buffers in order to configure um, the amount of cache storage needed for each one of the virtual private machines.
Another thing that I'm very interested in is providing higher level machine abstractions. So the programmer can really think about their application in the terms that they want to, say in the streaming application domain, instead of in terms of virtual private machines, and also providing developer tools that work between both the machine abstractions and, um, and the programmer in order to allow the programmer to kind of visualize the performance of their applications. So another important area is um, system policies and actually using these virtual private machines to characterize applications resource requirements so that we can build more efficient systems. So one of the things that I can do to extend this virtual private machine, another thing I can do to extend this virtual private machine is to apply it to power. And the way we do that is by defining the notion of a maximum virtual private machine. So up to this point we really defined a minimum virtual private machine and we, just, we said that this provides performance isolation. But if we are able to assign maximum virtual private machines and we assume that power monotonicity holds, which we know is the case, right? A task's uh, power consumption is just a monotonic function of its resource usage. Then we can use this virtual private machine abstraction also to control power, temperature, and things like transistor wear out. Um, we also want to be able to characterize this power fault tolerance and possibly reliability requirements using these higher level programmer abstractions. And then use all of this to optimize system-wide power performance and reliability. Now there are many challenges also in evaluating this work. Um, just to summarize, I plan to look at uh, applications in both the embedded domain and also data center server types of applications. And going forward, I think the real uh, challenge to, you know, in evaluating this work is being able to simulate these long-term workload characteristics. And to do that, I'm expecting to use FPGAs and synthesizing the transaction level structural model that I developed at IBM. Uh, the uh, virtual private machine uh, model for uh, applications that really have hard deadlines. Like you've got uh, speech decompression that has to be going continuously as the phone is receiving uh, data. So, so a lot of the abstraction that we define uh, is based on things that could provide hard deadlines. However, in many cases, we have to use approximations of, say, the fair queuing algorithms, the proportional fair scheduler, um, in order to make them efficient. Um, and so I think this is actually a very interesting topic, and is, is how do we, um, you know, we really looked at this in the context of general purpose computing, you know, how would we have to change the mechanisms for them to apply in this, this kind of hard real-time uh, environment. But I think that's possible. It'll just take additional analysis. Yes? So. <coughs> At a given point in time, I'll only schedule uh, processes that either meet or undersubscribe the existing resources. But if you have a lot of tasks which in total would oversubscribe the resources, does it have another mechanism to bound the number of times individual tasks will be left out of the cycle? Oh, yeah. So, so this is a, a classic emission control problem. And so based on, you know, I talked about kind of these multidimensional packing problems. And actually, some of these multidimensional packing approximate methods have something that is able to effectively do exactly what you say, prevent things that would oversubscribe the system from entering the system, admission control. So, so you, you just block the extra task in the first place rather than the, give it well, the, the, the place. Yes, the first step is to recognize that the system is overloaded. The second step is to determine what to do. One approach is just to block the task. Say, say you cannot be admitted to the system. There's other approaches though, we could say, um, look at the priority of the tasks and revoke kind of already admitted tasks that have a lower priority. Um, there's a number of policies that we could, we could also try to kind of redistribute the resources amongst these virtual private machine configurations. And so that really is a kind of a system or application specific design decision. And so we could build a policy or policies uh, that do any one of those things. Yes? How far does this scale? I mean, you know, you showed four cores, ten cores, hundred cores, thousand. Um, no, so 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 this is one of the future research challenges, also. So what I really kind of talked about today were these kind of monolithic shared microarchitectural resources. Where going forward, we really know that these resources, as we scale up, are going to be more distributed in nature. And so I think one of the interesting challenges is is how do we apply a reasonable perform or, or reasonable abstractions like the virtual private machine abstraction to this distributed microarchitecture. And so in many ways, what the virtual private machine behaves like, it's like a virtual private machine overlay, right? Where we can't effectively guarantee that virtual private machine, but we can somehow approximate it. I think the difficulty is in determining what is approximate and defining that precisely. Yes? 
Also, if you were to look at the cloud computing and things on the data center scale, would this apply to virtual machines running uh, with a shared uh, network bus and other larger level resources? Or yeah, so I, I, I'm not sure, but that is something that I'm interested in looking at. Um, definitely things, so, so, so the next step wouldn't be to go to like the big data center servers, but to go to um, just, just the other resources inside of a computer system, I.O. ports and you know, that type, you know, disks and things of that nature. And so in fact, there's actually been some work on that. Um, you know, Zen, for example, uh, has some type of fair queuing mechanism that, that um, you know, arbitrates between requests for the shared disk bandwidth. Um, and I think really what, what this would require is just integrating kind of existing techniques that people are talking about into the abstraction to provide kind of a whole system abstraction. The next step then, I guess, would be to go to the large Google-style distributed, um, distributed systems. Yes? Have you thought about how um, when uh, adjacent requests for some resource interact, how that gets represented in your framework? Like, you know, for DRAM, if you, if you make multiple requests that are close to each other, that can be better than if they're broken up. So it's adjacent in time, temporally adjacent. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and so, so yes, so we, do, we definitely characterize how those, um, those, those, those things interact. And so um, one of the things is we, we provide, if they're, if they're requests from different, different um, tasks, we, we ensure that we provide these bandwidth guarantees. But that is, it's not perfect, right? There's also this preemption latency, which I think you're kind of you know, alluding to, that has to be taken into account. Um, right, where, where we can't just simply start servicing one request and then drop it on the floor as soon as another request comes in. And so, like I said, some of these things are somewhat approximate, um, but we do take them to account and uh, actually model all of these, these, these different problems. So if you had examples up there where, you know, one virtual product machine had 25% of L1 cache and 50% of L2 cache, um, if you're using time sharing to accomplish this, does it even make sense to give different proportions on that? Like, would you have another process having part of the L1 cache during that extra 25% of time where the first process had the other 50% of the L2 cache? Um, I, I think so. I mean, so we've kind of decoupled this process of determining what a, a virtual private machine is and actually satisfying the virtual private machine. So the, 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 the idea of you know, determining what a virtual private machine configuration really depends on um, whatever the performance objective or requirements of the application are. And so in some cases, in order to satisfy those performance objectives, you may need a larger cache, a smaller cache. You may need a larger temporal component, smaller temporal component. Um, and in many cases, I said that these were incomparable, uh, that we have a partial ordering. So what that means is that we can actually have two virtual private machines that provide the, the same performance, but are, are incomparable elements in our ordering. And which one is better, I think, depends on um, a lot of kind of interesting, you know, questions that, that, that you kind of alluded to. More questions? We still have some time. I actually had a, I was curious about, um, if you have resources like interconnection network in a, in, in a large scale, let's say imagine 120 cores, where you can't really uh, pinpoint a resource with a single number. So how would you, uh, yeah, so this is, this is a very interesting point. In fact, there's a, there's a paper coming up in ISCA on providing quality service over general interconnection networks. Mm -hmm. So the difficulty is, is that um, pretty much everything that, that I've done so far has assumed that we have very large buffers, right? So, so that we can actually make these queuing decisions and that the buffers don't back up and kind of cause cascading delays. Mm -hmm. The difference in an interconnection network, um, and I'm sorry, the reason we can make that assumption is because in general these buffers are not a real critical resource in the types of kind of monolithic architectures I'm looking at. They're really kind of very small in comparison with say the cache storage or the SDRAM memory system control. Um, so the difference in uh, an, a general interconnection network is that these bandwidth res or these buffer resources can be actually a, a large component of the total interconnection network's area. And so that is what causes or prevents us from applying these fair queuing techniques directly. Um, the solutions that people tend to look at when, when you can't assume this infinite buffer or make this infinite buffer assumption is that they tend to uh, control the rate at which data enters um, the interconnection network. And based on that, you can actually provide some type, some stochastic bounds on a level of quality of service mm -hmm. that you're actually able to offer inside of the interconnection network. Mm -hmm. All right. 
Oh, one more question. As a follow-up to one of the earlier questions, uh, if you're controlling access to SD RAM and you have a stream of dynamic accesses, and it doesn't matter whether it's from one resource or another, if they all go to the same DRAM page, it's much more efficient to service those contiguously because the page is already open. Yes. Um, but that's not the kind of information you have ahead of time because it depends on actual address sequence. Okay. So do you treat all those accesses as uniform, let's say, uh, one unit requests, or do you do some sort of optimization where you say, the first one is more expensive than all subsequent ones? Yeah. Yes, so, so we actually do. We take that, take that into account. Um, and this is actually, if you're, if you're really interested in this, you can look at our micro paper, but at a very high level, what we do is, is we allow a task, once it opens a page, to effectively have a, a window of time that it can keep that page open and service these requests very fast in this very efficient manner. And then after that, 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 that window of time, we force that page to close so that other threads can get fair access to that bank. So, so and effectively, you know, the mechanism that we provide is able, you're able to adjust that. And we've looked at it a little bit, um, you know, what's the right time window. And it turns out it's only a couple of requests. 